Hello, my name is Jasmine Saw. I'm the chair of the Adult Advanced Life Support Working Group for the European Resuscitation Council Guidelines 2021. And it gives me great pleasure to present these new guidelines for 2021. I'd like to thank my writing group colleagues who are listed here, who've all participated in the writing of these guidelines. Before I move on, these are the conflicts of interest of the writing group members. Those not listed have no conflicts. And I'll just give you a few moments to look at these, but they are all in the main guideline publication as well. First and foremost, for all resuscitation guidelines, and again in this advanced life support guideline, it's important for us to recognise that the key intervention is actually the prevention of cardiac arrest. And we know that both in and out of hospital cardiac arrest, patients often have pre-monetary signs suggesting they are at risk. For example, in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest patients, if you look back at the history, they will often have a history of preceding chest pain in the hours, days or weeks prior to the cardiac arrest. Or in younger adults, there may be a history of syncope or you know, during exercise or while supine. And these warning signs are often not recognised by the patient. And more concerningly, often not recognised by clinicians. So both in hospital and out of hospital, we need to be you know, looking for patients at risk and hopefully doing interventions that prevent progression to cardiac arrest. And in hospitals, this has become far more common. And again, the guidelines emphasis emphasise the use of early warning scores to identify and treat, treat patients at risk of cardiac arrest. So the use of rapid response systems, early warning scores, and an escalation plan where a abnormal score leads to calling for expert or senior help for escalating treatment. And part of this, part of the guidelines also covers the use of decisions about escalation of treatment and do not attempt CPR decisions and recommendations. This is the 2021 adult ALS guide, uh, algorithm. It looks very similar to the previous 2015 algorithm and covers the key issues with recognition of cardiac arrest, calling for help, which could be an ambulance or in hospital a resuscitation team, early CPR with a 30 to 2 compression ratio, assessing the rhythm and then having a shockable and non-shockable side of the algorithm, shockable rhythms, single shocks, two minute cycles of CPR. And during those two minute cycles, other interventions listed in those boxes below which I'll cover in more detail during the rest of my talk. As for all resuscitation, high quality CPR and early defibrillation are the key interventions to get the most survivors. And by high quality chest compressions, I mean you know, hard, fast, at five to six centimeters, at 100 to 120 minutes per, 120 compressions per minute. And as soon as the pads are on, assessing the rhythm and giving a shock for VF, if appropriate, or pulseless PT, if appropriate. And for those rescuers, and in ALS, you know, we are moving towards you know, encouraging rescuers to use an AED if they don't, can't recognise rhythms rapidly, and using a manual defibrillator if they can recognise rhythms rapidly, to minimise any pause for shock delivery to less than five seconds. That 
Well, that means a re rapid assessment of rhythm, charging drink impressions, a minimum pre-shock pause, giving a shock and immediately resuming compressions. This is the box at the bottom of the algorithm. It says during CPR, you know, we want high quality chest compressions, we want oxygen at the highest possible inspired oxygen concentration. We want people to use waveform capnography if they're used in an advanced airway or bag mass ventilation. We want to minimize interruptions to compression, intravenous or IO access. And I'll cover these further points later, but giving adrenaline every three to five minutes, the use of amiodrone in patients who've remained in VF despite three shocks, whether they're consecutive or at different points during the arrest. In settings where you don't have amiodrone, lidocaine you know, can be used instead and in identifying and treating reversible causes. Just to say a little bit, a bit more about airway and ventilation during CPR, the guidelines recommend a stepwise approach to airway management, which depends on the skills of the rescuer. So rescuers should only use those skills that they can, that are effective in that patient in their hands. So, you know, if you, if you can do bag mass ventilation effectively, make the chest rise, give a high inspired oxygen, that's what you should do. If you can insert a supraglottic airway, that becomes an option. Only those rescuers who have skills in tracheal intubation should use it. And the writing group has, the consensus of the writing group was that, you know, only those systems or individuals who can yeah, who in their practice have a greater than 95% success rate within two attempts should be using tracheal intubation. And as I've said before, we should be giving the maximum inspired oxygen during CPR. Adrenaline remains in the guidelines. And when we've looked at the results of the paramedic two randomized controlled trial and other studies, it, it does, these do give us a bit more understanding of the role of adrenaline. And the evidence suggests that, you know, if we are going to use adrenaline, we should be giving it as soon as possible for adults in cardiac arrest with a non-shockable rhythm. It should probably only be used delayed in patients with shockable rhythm. So after the first three shocks, and once the first dose has been given, subsequent doses should be given every three to five minutes, which is every two cycles of CPR. Now, one of, one of the concerns is, is that whether it makes a difference to outcome. And we know from the data that it improves both the incidence of ROSC, survival to hospital discharge, and the number of survivors with a good neurological outcome but also those probably with a poor neurological outcome. And, and these, these remain issues where further studies are required. But again, it, it stays in the guidelines and the way it's given hasn't really changed from the 2015 guideline. Just going back to identifying and treating reversible causes, the four H's and four T's remain in the guidelines as for previous guidelines. The addition is this, this sentence at the bottom, consider ultrasound imaging to identify reversible causes. So only those skilled in the use of point of care ultrasound during CPR should actually be doing this. And the aim is to acquire rapid images with minimal interruption to compression, CPR continues, the images are reviewed, and they may help identify some treatable causes of cardiac arrest, such as cardiac tamponade and pneumothorax. And it's important to remember that the images shouldn't be used alone to make a diagnosis of, for example, pulmonary embolism, 
because right ventricular dilation can occur in many causes of cardiac arrest. And also that if the heart looks completely still during pulmonary, uh, during PEA, that alone is not used as a poor prognostic indicator. Other factors such as the heart rhythm, the duration of arrest, uh, the antidepressant CO2 should also be considered. But ultrasound has an increasing role during CPR. Again, these three, these three key points during CPR are again the same as in the 2015 guidelines. We, we do want people considering mechanical CPR to facilitate transfer and treatment, and that could include coronary angiography for patients with acute myocardial infarction and transferring patients to extracorporeal CPR. So this is only available in some settings, but the number of settings offering uh, ventricular arterial ECMO during CPR is increasing in Europe. And we still don't know which groups it works best in, but it should be considered as a rescue therapy for selected patients, specifically when there's an underlying cause that the eCPR buys time for correction, such as coronary angiography and percutaneous coronary intervention, massive pulmonary embolism, rewarming after hypothermic cardiac arrest, and other scenarios where there's a defined treatable cause, which buying time with VA ECMO will help increase survival. And again, as I've said before, this requires specialist teams and settings with a you know, established system in place. So it's not going to be available in all settings, but it's, it's a promising therapy for groups of patients who would otherwise not survive. After ROSC, again, this is covered more, more in detail in the post-resuscitation care section. You know, rescuers should use an ABCDE approach, aiming for a normal oxygen saturation and partial pressure of CO2, identifying treating the cause and targeted temperature management. So these, these remain the same as in the previous guidelines. I'm going to move on now to tachycardias and uh, periarrest arrhythmias have been part of the ALS guidelines you know, previously. And what we've tried to do in this in the, in the 2021 update is focus on those patients who have a life-threatening tachycardia. And, and specifically, the algorithm's been split in with a dotted line across the top there, where the top, top part of the algorithm specifically gives the management of those patients with life-threatening features, which is based on giving synchronized shocks with anesthesia or sedation as required. And the rest of the algorithm is for tachycardias where the patient at that moment is stable and there's always the opportunity to get experts help if rescuers aren't sure. But these have, these, the algorithms aligned with the current guidelines from the European Society of Cardiology on managing other tachyarrhythmias. Just focusing on that top part of the algorithm. So again, an ABCD assessment, correcting hypoxia, hypovolemia, and other reversible causes of a tachycardia. Um, if it's a tachyarrhythmia, such as ventricular tachycardia, an SVT, or very rapid AF, causing life-threatening features, giving a synchronized shock. Um, so the focus of ALS and the ALS courses will be this sort of top row. And finally, bradycardias. And bradycardia algorithms 
unchanged really from the 2015 algorithm. So again, if there's adverse signs or life-threatening features, the use of atropine or other anticholinergics such as glycopuronium, second line drugs such as isoprenaline and adrenaline, uh, considering uh, external pacing when these fail or other drugs. So the algorithm looks much the same as the 2015 algorithm in that, um, you know, recognizing if the patient has life-threatening features using atropine and increasing doses of atropine up to three milligrams, second line drugs, and those alternative drugs listed at the bottom and considering pacing. I'm going to close here and just summarize with some top messages. So remember, high quality chest compressions with minimal interruption, early defibrillation, and treatment of reversible causes remain the priority. Remember that many, many patients who have a cardiac arrest have pre-monetary warning signs and symptoms, and both in and out of hospital, we should be looking for the, these as opportunities to prevent cardiac arrest in many patients. Uh, use the airway technique that works best in your hands. So you can use bag mask ventilation, supraglottic airways, and only those with a high success rate should use tracheal intubation. Use adrenaline early for non-shockable cardiac arrest. And in select patients, if feasible, consider extracorporeal CPR as a rescue therapy when conventional ALS is failing. Thank you all for listening. And I hope you know you take home these key messages and put them into your clinical practice. Thank you.